Coming up on show 846, we look at the Mustang Mach-E turns into a tyre-killing machine. It's been teased by Ford Performance. Stick around, I'll give you the details. Plus on the podcast today, a massive stamping machine for the Tesla Model Y. I didn't know that the battery pack wasn't completely universal between the 3 and the Y, but it will be very soon. And... How big is too big for a dash display? The Cadillac Lyric is going to test your limits on that one. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're listening around the world. Welcome to EV News Daily. Uh, This is what happened on Tuesday, 21st of July. My name is Martin Lee, and I go through every story in the EV world, so you don't have to. So recent images from Tesla's Gigafactory in Shanghai suggest a rather complex installation of the Made in China Model Y stamping press. It looks like it's nearing completion. Well, the photos that have leaked bode well for the progress of the Shanghai-based factory, as it suggests that the trial production runs of the Model Y could yet indeed begin sooner than expected, Teslarati say, before the end of the year. Now, I did expect the trial run, the pre-production for Model Y to begin before the end of the year. Maybe they weren't quite as optimistic, maybe they had more details, more info that I didn't, but I was expecting just the the rate at which the new building has gone up at uh, Shanghai, even quicker than the Model 3 building. The Model Y would indeed be coming sooner rather than later. The pictures from Giga Shanghai feature a massive stamping press. Looks all but completely set up. At one end of the massive machine, it also included a banner uh, that reads the words, Good fortune for finishing the installation of Giga Shanghai stamping line. Uh, Well, with the installation of the Model Y factory stamping press in mind, as well as the presence of a a big sky bridge between the two buildings, the big Model 3 building, uh, the big Model Y building, which is currently underway, there's a big bridge between the two. Now, what's that for? Well, it could just be for people to nip across and get their lunch on their lunch break or it could be for something slightly more complex and maybe that is to link the two production facilities maybe if there's a massive stamping press in one half uh, maybe that'll be to take model three bits over to the other side or vice versa we'll have to wait and see but either way it's interesting to watch Uh, uh, yeah i think it's yeah that's the best word interesting to see tesla build a gigafactory elon has talked you know, repeatedly about how, you know, the, the real machines they build are the factories, not the cars. And, you know, I do I do look at that and think, you know, Tesla have got... Uh, it, it's from a standing start, which is both an advantage and a disadvantage. But really, they're not bound up by any legacy ways of making cars. And so it's interesting, everything that they've learned over the last 10 years, they're applying to Giga Shanghai, and we know that this time next year, when they open up Giga Berlin, it's going to be applied to that. And then, when it's Giga or Terra Factory Austin, where the, the Cybertruck will be made, uh, all the things they'll learn from the, everything else they've done and wrap them into that. It's fascinating. It's really fascinating to watch. We talk about the cars, but what about the factories that build the cars? We know Elon's obsessed with the, uh, uh, the factories, and they just seem to be getting more and more interesting all the time. Uh, So in addition to a few notes about the Tesla Semi battery and the Tesla Semi pilot production line coming along, we also learned this week that the Model 3 and the Model Y battery packs will soon be universal. That was the word this tweet used, universal. And I wonder what that really means. According to Clean Technica, it appears there's been a difference in the battery packs between the 3 and the Y. It seems the differences come down to manufacturing improvements that Tesla and Panasonic have made to the Model Y batteries, making them better than Model 3. Now, we know, like, I knew all along that they'd made some improvements on the Model Y because they have a bigger car that has to carry more weight and yet is not at a proportional disadvantage to the Model 3 in terms of performance and mileage. So what I, I don't, I'm not going to look back at what podcast it was, but, uh, you know, for uh, for those that are listening behind uh, or, or going back to the odd episode, you'll hear me on a previous show earlier this year speculate that they were throttling a little bit of Model 3 performance, if they're using the same battery packs in 3 and Y, that they were actually just holding back the 3 a little bit, but getting the most out of the Y's battery pack in order for that difference in performance and range and the specs not to be a vast gulf between the 3 and the Y. Well, it turns out I was probably wrong on that because, well, according to this 
tweet from an insider. Actually, the battery pack they were using in the 3 doesn't have some of the enhancements that were made for the Model Y. We're only talking USB built vehicles here, by the way. Uh, but the improvements they made for the Model Y are now being passed on to the Model 3. Presumably, as Tesla is able to update the production lines, none of this applies to the Chinese. Uh, the LFP batteries on the standard range plus it's a different chemistry, a uh, different way of making the batteries. Uh, a final note from this tweet indicates that the heat pump from the Model Y, which is the only car in the range of Tesla which has a heat pump, is indeed coming to the Model 3. And that will be good news for anyone listening to this podcast in a cold climate where heat pumps tend to work very well. Let's talk about a secret project from Tesla. Electrek has discovered a new Tesla secret project called Palladium. Project Palladium involves it updates to the Model S and the Model X. And I'm personally relieved to hear this because if they're going to carry on selling the S and the X, and we know that the bulk of their sales are the, the 3 and the Y, if they are going to do that, they've got to be premium cars that sit at the very top of the range. But honestly... They haven't been. They've charged a lot slower and they haven't had the latest technology and various other things as well. And so actually, although they've been making some improvements to the charging speed of the S and the X recently for the cars made uh, this year, the Raven update, etc., uh, this new project, Project Palladium, involves building a whole new production line for an updated version of the S and the X. It's unclear how far reaching this update is going to be. Uh, Tesla is keeping all of this information com uh, compartmentalized even within the company. So on a, a need-to-know basis, says Electric. According to people familiar with the matter, the new update is going to involve new battery modules and drive units that will be the basis of the Plaid version of the S and the X. The new powertrain is going to enable a tri-motor configuration with new performance and efficiency benchmarks and... You've got to say as well, for Tesla, a company that is so obsessed with simplifying everything, whether it's a handful of paint options or even on the Model Y, you know, which one do you want? Long range or performance? You can have any one you want, it's a choice of two. For a company that's so obsessed with, with rationalising choices, uh, it, I... I Personally, it must it must hurt them to put one set of screens inside the S and the X and another set of screens inside everything else. And so I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of the year uh, you're seeing exactly the same screen interior across the whole range. So new internals, new motor, uh, new battery electronics, uh, new things like heat pumps. Uh, new batteries, and uh, you would, you've got to say, even if the outsides get a slight tweak, maybe if uh, designers and uh, Franz von Holzhausen, who leads that team, are going to do some tweaks to the outside. I mean, basically, you know, if I see an S or an X on the streets, it still looks good to me, to my eye, at least. Still looks contemporary, still looks cutting edge. Maybe they just do a, a, a few things. I mean, they've always said that Tesla doesn't believe in a design language for a, for the company. In fact, Franz has said that before. They, they don't believe in having, you know, like, um, let me think of an example, like the BMW grill, right? So, so many car companies have a design language. All their cars look the same, you know, smaller versions or bigger versions. They've said before, we don't believe in that, right? So that's why we can have at one end a, a car which is a, a, the Cybertruck, which is crazy, um, and then another car which will look nothing like it. So, otherwise they would have released a truck, which was basically a truck version of the 3 and the Y, and they didn't do that. So, interesting what they come back with, and as they become a more mature company, uh, what the S and the X look like. So let's talk Cadillac next, and the Cadillac Lyric is going to be an EV, and they want to make sure their first vehicle that is all-electric power gets noticed. With that in mind, Cadillac has shared images of the new interior. It is a giant curved interior screen on the dash. It's 33 inches. That's huge for a dash. It covers most of the dashboard in the Lyric EV, says Car and Driver. It's a 33-inch OLED display will be the infotainment system. It'll be the instrument gauge. It'll be the control for the lighting. Part of it is the head-up display behind the steering wheel. Uh, Caddy says that the, the giant screen is separated into technically three individual displays. But when parked up, you can use that as an entire single unit for entertainment. Well, let's talk about these pictures that we've seen today of the Mustang Mach-E. The headline story today. 
a car that Ford just talked about called the Mustang Mach-E 1400. Uh, called that because it has 1,000. 381 brake horsepower but they're they're using creative license to round up a bit so it's got 1400 brake horsepower and it's called the Mackie 1400 and uh, it is a shockingly high performance car it is using seven motors work that one out four wheels seven motors according to car throttle website that's five more units fitted to the gt uh, the most powerful road going version of the mac e um three on the front diff so three motors feeding the front differential the remaining four are arranged in what they call a pancake style at the back connected to the rear differential on a single drive shaft well powering the heptad of motors is a a battery pack that's just shy of 60 kilowatt hours. It is cooled using dielectric coolant, whatever that is. No, I haven't Googled it. Uh, it'll be optimized for drifting. And so Ken Block has got his hands on it, I imagine, by now. Uh, it's it's optimized for lap time heroics. Uh, if, if, if you want to do a, a fast lap time, uh, you can rely on a giant rear wing. There's a huge front splitter. There's aero devices all over this thing. And it'll generate 1,000 kilograms of downforce at 160 miles an hour. It is an insane concept car. The Ford engineers or whatever company's done this in collaboration with Ford, but I think Ford are claiming the credit for it, uh, have just gone wild. Absolutely wild. And if you get a kick out of seeing a car smoking its tires, with all electric power, just Google Mustang Mac E 1400-1400. Let's talk Hummer next. Every civilian Hummer model that's on the roads can trace its roots back to the Humvee, uh, which is very famous for making uh, combat duties. Made its debut in Panama when the US invaded Panama in 89. And if you fast forward to the 2020s, the tables could be turned because the military might be interested in an all-electric uh, GMC Hummer. It says Autoblog, the upcoming Hummer is a full-size truck with 400 miles of range, 1,000 pound-feet of torque, very highly capable, and that could provide a great base platform for an EV in a military context. And that's, that's interesting. Uh, there is a, uh, a company called General Motors Defence, and they were talking to GM Authority, talking about how actually electric cars on military duty make a lot of sense. Because if you are taking military vehicles into a combat zone, or if you're taking, if you're in theatre and you need to get fuel in, that in itself is a hell of an operation. Just bringing in petrol and diesel into a combat zone. But electricity is largely everywhere. And I mean that in, in the terms of you can make your own. So whether that is wind turbines, whether it's solar panels uh, at the base, uh, whether it is some sort of fuel to create electricity that has a high energy density, like generators, like hydrogen, has a high energy density, you can use that to then create electricity. It just makes a lot of sense to run EVs in a, in a, in a military environment. Uh, it seems to me anyway, uh, from, from someone who's a million miles away from that, uh, that in terms of fueling your vehicles, it could solve a lot of the problems. Next, two more stories. The Renault Twingo ZE. This is a tiny little city car. Uh, the Renault Twingo has its price in Germany now announced. The new electric model is scheduled for market release later this year. Uh, produced in Slovenia. And the official pricing wasn't announced when we talked about it the first time round. But now we know it'll be available in Germany where there are some big uh, subsidies and incentives between nine and 10,000 euros if you buy an EV there. Starting price of the Renault Twingo, like I say, tiny little city car, is €21,000, depending on VAT, which is 16%, in some places 19% in others, and it sounds a lot for a tiny car. It's got a 22 kilowatt hour battery. Right, so with VAT, next year, 19%, in Germany, €25,000 for a car that has, 20, that has 22 kilowatt hours and is, is entirely impractical for anything else but a city car. The problem is, selling EVs in Germany, that the subsidies are so good that actually, by the time you take off the 10,000 euros incentives with nine and 10,000, 
actually, it, you can end up paying 15,000 euros for a city car with a 22 kilowatt hour battery, which is actually not out of this world. So I'll ask the question to you. We always talk about subsidies and incentives being a good thing. We want more of them. We like money off our cars. But is there such thing as well, too much of a good thing? Because that price that Renault was selling the Twingo for 25 grand in Germany, it would not be 25 grand in Germany if there wasn't 10,000 pounds worth of subsidies. It simply would not. Put my neck on the line and say it simply wouldn't be advertised and sold for that because it's not worth it. it. Must have a hell of a margin on it. It's making money off on free government money. Okay, finally, Oxford in the UK. The city council in Oxford is trialling its first electric refuse collection vehicle. They call them RCVs. I would call them the rubbish lorry. But anyway, ahead uh, of plans to replace uh, all the vehicles in the fleet. There's 27 of them in Oxford, in case you've ever wondered. I know I haven't. How many bin lorries in Oxford? 27. And they're all diesel. Uh, according to the Let's Recycle website, Oxford District Services uh, is assessing how the electric uh, refuse collection vehicles perform over a test. It's happening this week. And the vehicle, which is purpose-built, is uh, being made in the UK. The trial happens this weekend. If it goes well, uh, it is a significant investment, they say, uh, to replace all of those vehicles with electric versions. And I don't know about your bin collection day. Mine is always Friday mornings. And it's always very, very early. Uh, so this time of year, it's hot. Windows are open when we sleep. And it's normally our alarm clock early on a Friday. Um, if the little fella hasn't woken up and crying, um, then it's the bin lorry. And an electric one, well, that would mean that I get just a little more beauty sleep. Maybe. Thank you for listening today. Love to know your thoughts on anything, anytime. My email address is hello at evnewsdaily.com. Leave a comment on the YouTube show if you want to. Well, there are 845 previous episodes in the archive. Thank you very much to all of our Patreon fans for keeping the archive online, up and running. Our premium partners are Phil Roberts of Electric Future, Brad Crosby, Avid Technology, uh, Brightsmith Group, Porsche of the Village in Cincinnati, Audi of Cincinnati East, uh, Volvo Cars of Cincinnati East, and now NationalCarCharging.com and AlohaCharge.com. Have a wonderful day. Catch you tomorrow. And remember, there's no such thing as a self-charging hybrid.